So let's begin. Endoscopic, endoscopic ear surgery in its modern day form has really been around for over 10 years now with some of the first published works being around 2008, 2009. And for me, I first came across endoscopic ear surgery when the International Working Group was formed in 2012 at the Nagasaki meeting at the International Conference for Cholesteatoma and Ear Surgery. And at that time, uh, there were several hundred otologists all sitting around watching a large screen for uh, a conference plenary and it was a live dissection of endoscopic ear surgery with Professor Daniele Marchioni from Verona and we could see this beautiful dissection occurring and then we saw quite vehement opposition from the well-known microscopic surgeons a couple of them one in particular um, commenting quite aggressively that this is quite unsafe and dangerous and this shouldn't be happening and it's dangerous to the patients. And at that point, I realized that this was right, quite a nexus in the history of otology and endoscopes probably had a significant part to play. And the first question is, why would we actually want to use an endoscope? And here's some nice work from Mark Bennett showing how when we place the surgeon's eye into the ear, which is what the endoscope does, you can get an improved view. So it's comparing orange and blue, <coughs> excuse me, orange and blue with the orange being the view and the blue being the bit that we can't see between a microscope, a zero degree endoscope, a 30 degree endoscope and a 45 degree endoscope. And you can see as we progressively angulate the scope, we get a much better view, not just of the pro tympanum and the retro tympanum, but with the 45 degree scope and no removal of bone, we can even see into the epi tympanum. So it's this contextual view, placing the surgeon's eye into the ear, that is the big difference in, uh, in, in endoscopic ear surgery. Uh, if we can get similar results, of course, with doing the surgery through the ear canal, then we can avoid some of the potential issues that we have with post incisions. And you can see here, one of my own patients are presented with a mastocutaneous fistula. And you can see quite typical findings after a canal wall down mastoidectomy with a large meatoplasty. You can see his flattened ear, his left ear compared to his right ear, compared to a patient with a, a traditional endoscopic ear follow-up. And so for me, one of the major issues, apart from the fact that the endoscope pro provides a contextual view of the anatomy and it, uh, and it uh, allows the surgeon to see the disease anatomy interface much better, is that if we can perform similar procedures without an incision, then of course this is a big win. And one of the major wins for me in applying this technique over the last eight years is that we have less postericular incisions in children. Now this is all being demonstrated with uh, improvements in quality of life outcomes as well. And this, this for us as endoscopic ear surgeons is, is quite obvious. If we can get similar outcomes, for example, for, with tympanoplasty and mesotympanic and epitympanic cholesteatoma, then of course, without an incision, there's going to be improved quality of life because we have no cosmetic incision. We usually have less pain and a quicker return to work. And this is borne out with uh, the Glasgow Benefit Inventory work here published by a colleague and friend of mine, Aaron Ayers Group in Glasgow, showing in his experience of 152 cases, significant quality of improvement to, in life with endoscopic ear surgery. And we published three years ago, a direct cost comparison between similar volume disease of endoscopic ear surgery when we have disease in the attic compared to uh, performed with a canal wall up and atacotomy compared to disease performed endoscopically. And after the learning curve has been achieved, there's a significant cost reduction in direct costs for the hospital and for the hospital system with about a two, th U, U thousand, uh, sorry, US 2000 cost reduction. And this is largely a cost reduction in surgical time because of course we're not opening and closing wounds and a reduction in uh, burr use where for example, you used to use four or five burrs for a canal wall up mastoidectomy. We'll often get away with either a curate or just one burr. Along with this, there's significant improvements I found in my own practice in the office. So here's a, um, here's a view of uh, the endoscope that was showing the patient live and it allows the patient to engage in their, here in their uh, health journey a lot better. And when they sort of see images of uh, the endoscope, even just performing simple procedures like this grommet, it really changes the whole operating room where not just the anesthetist, but the nursing staff and medical students and residents and registrars can all get the same view that the surgeon's viewing. And it really helps with explanation of uh, what's going on and really engages the operating room a lot more than what we used to see with the microscope. 
one major change has really been, and this is probably the greatest change that the endoscope offers, and that is that it allows us to teach and learn the anatomy in a much more contextual manner. So you can see when we're, um, when we're demonstrating to uh, registrars and to interns and residents and to patients as well, we can show them the anatomy in a much more contextual manner. And this, of course, allows us to learn the anatomy without the, the typical destructive approach of removing natural bone and removing structures to see the next layer of structures. So really, I would say this is the largest and greatest benefit of the endoscope that it's provided to us. So where are we in 2012 now? Well, the endoscope is really the prerogative of the middle ear and, and largely in managing perforations and cholesteatoma, largely of the mesotympanum and of the epitympanum. But as we progress with our endoscope journey and we get become more and more confident with the use of the endoscope, then we are moving into using it towards the inner ear and stapedectomy, although I'd argue that really the benefits are not that great with stapedectomy. I mean, in a lot of people's hands, it can be done with a microscope quite adeptly transcanal anyway. And so the big advantages that we thought initially with stapedectomy, which was reduced curatage and less damage to the uh, to the quarter tympani, don't seem to be borne out with the literature. And there seems to be a trend towards some increased worse outcomes when we're learning this technique, uh, doing it endoscopically. So in this situation, we still alternate quite a lot between the endoscope and the microscope. But as we progress with our confidence in understanding the anatomy and the disease interface, we're expanding its use into the cochlear and the vestibule and towards vestibular schwannoma and applying it in extended uses for uh, superior canal dehiscence and other extensions of the lateral temporal bone. But the greatest advantages are in this sort of scenario where we can repair these sort of large perforations, subtotal and total perforations with a transcanal approach. And you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, this is an endoscopic view. And you can imagine with the microscope, the view would be really just of the posterior uh, tympanic membrane. And we can perform these procedures transcanal and give the patients very similar outcomes, if not better quality of life outcomes than performing it postericularly. So let me just show you a demonstration of one. This is a six-year-old girl who had previous uh, tubes and was getting waterborne ear infections and mild hearing loss. And you can see this significant perforation with a mild air bone gap. And we can perform a, a button graft in this sort of scenario. And here is tragal cartilage. You can see this thin elastic type of tragal cartilage that we get in a six-year-old and creating a, a a, a uh, grommet-like button to place into the tympanic membrane and then placing that in. And we get quite nice outcomes where we're getting uh, post-operative appearances like this here, four weeks post-op, with an improvement in the uh, air bone gap. And we published a version of this, our version of endoscopic composite cartilage graft for subtotal and total perforations uh, two years ago and showing with a, with a series of over 50 patients with a 12 month follow up that a 91% take rate was achievable transcanal for these large subtotal and total perforations. So fairly similar outcomes to the underlay techniques that we were taught with postericular incisions or endoral, but these were all done transcanal. Let me share with you some um, work here in terms of published outcomes for tympanoplasty. And we can now see as time progresses that we're getting the efficacy and the hearing rates, in other words, take rates and hearing rates demonstrated to be quite similar with type 1 tympanoplasty compared to microscopic techniques and obviously less, less invasive. So I think this technique of tympanoplasty repair with the endoscope has now been fairly firmly established as a method that has at least equal outcomes without the postricular incision. Let me share with you some work that we've just submitted in different endoscopic tympanoplasty techniques. And here we're looking at a primary outcome measure of take rates at 12 months and secondary outcomes being hearing and complication rates. Looking at a meta-analysis of proportions for success rate and a meta-analysis of means for the pure tone audiometry. And we compared the different subtypes of endoscopic tympanoplasty, noticing that really majority of these uh, publications were case series and the quality of studies was quite poor. And we demonstrated here that there wasn't really a, a great difference that we could demonstrate in terms of statistically significant differences, but there was a trend towards improved success with the interlay method endoscopically. But I caution you that really this was just from one group, two studies published from one group. So it could be just a variant seen within that group. Um, but nonetheless, there was an improved uh, take rate at 12 months with the interlay. And the hearing rates were fairly similar amongst all of the uh, different techniques. 
and complication rates pretty similar to microscopic groups here. So we can see here in this situation that the main sort of complications we see that's of significance is epithelial cysts like this with the interlay graft. And this is seen also with the microscopic version of this technique. Now with endoscopic acicular reconstruction, there's no real major advantage using the endoscope here. I would say the only significant benefits are an avoidance of any incision. And we do get a better visualization when you're looking at that last bit of coupling and you know when we're placing the tympanomiatal flap back and we wanna just sneak a look underneath the flap to make sure that the coupling still in, in good order before we place everything into the ear canal. And here the endoscope, particularly the 30 degree endoscope is quite beneficial compared to when I used to use a microscope and was trying to have a look. We'd have to lift everything all up again to check that the coupling was still good. But this is um, sort of against the downside of the disadvantage of having to do single-handed placement. So in this sort of scenario, I still alternate between the endoscope and the microscope. And we'll come to how and where the endoscope is placed in the current uh, regime or, or, or landscape of otology later on in the talk. So now we can see again with uh, tympana, so with the secular reconstruction, we're getting similar audio audiometric outcomes to the microscopic technique. Let's just show you an example of the sort of view that we get here in an epitympanic cholesteatoma. And this is a self-discharging right ear, a right uh, cholesteatoma in the epitympanum and a, a traditional tympanomiatal flap at two and six o'clock. And here a view where we're performing a curatage to try and demonstrate all of the limits of the uh, cholesterol A lovely view here of the primary isthmus and the secondary isthmus. And you can see the contextual and ana anatomical view we can get without removing ossicles to get a view. And, and here we're dividing the incodostopedial joint. We can see the quarter tympani we preserved in this case because it wasn't involved with the disease. And after removing the incus, we can get a lovely view of the limits of the sac. You can see how we can see the end of the sac in this sort of view. And this view for me, but previously would have been an adichotomy to get a view like this, possibly with a postricular view to get a, a, a view of this disease. And we can remove this disease confidently and then repair with a, a primary acicular reconstruction. Let me just demonstrate here a retrotympanic disease. And this was a child with progressive hearing loss and recurring infections and squamous epithelium in the retrotympanum. This is a right ear with a surgical view, ipsilateral with a zero degree scope. And then with a 30 degree scope, we can start to see the limits of the sac, but then look at the view that we get when we move to the contralateral side. So when we get to the contralateral side, we're, um, I'll just go back to that view. When we get to the contralateral side, we're lifting up a tympanomiatal flap, but we can really get a much nicer view of what's going on in a contextual view. So you can see here now ipsilateral view with a um, with the neuropathy in place with the incodostopedial joint on the left. And then let's move to the contralateral side of the patient. And you can see now the disease very clearly running along the stapedius tendon and into the sinus tympani here and the sinus subtympanicus. For us as surgeons then, as we're removing disease from named structures, it's very pleasing for us to do that. And it gives us a lot of confidence in our disease removal. And then we can get nice outcomes like this at 12 months with a cartilage tympanoplasty. So now we're getting fairly good five-year and even eight-year outcome data. And here's some work published from Professor Marchioni's group comparing his canal wall-ups and total endoscopic ear surgery with a, a 18 to 36-month follow-up. So short follow-up times in pediatric groups. But we can see here that the residual recurrence rates were equivalent and then trending towards reduced residual recurrence rates in the pediatric population. And this is echoed with further work from a friend of ours in uh, Chicago. Here's Stephen Hoff's group showing with a mean follow-up of 2.6 years in pediatric cases. And here we're doing cases that are largely, this is the Massachusetts grading for endoscopic ear surgery where 2B is more than 50% of the work is done with the endoscope and, and a class three is all of the work is done with the endoscope showing residual recurrence rates very similar to previous canal wall up at least published rates. And I would argue even canal wall down rates in children. But of course, with pediatric cholesterol, there's very few groups left in the world that would perform a canal wall down procedure in a child. So we're either doing uh, microscopic canal wall up work um, or, or endoscopic work. And here is work from our friends at uh, Harvard at Massachusetts INE, Michael Cohen and Dan Lee. And they showed similar residual recurrence rates in their pediatric populations. But what they noticed was that the rate of mastoidectomy and the post incision rate has been significantly reduced when comparing their cohorts from 63 to 33%. So quite a significant quality of life difference when avoiding the incisions here. And, and parents certainly tell us this and they'll tell you this if you're performing more and more pediatric work that it's really pleasing not to see the incisions. 
here is um, a meta-analysis looking at not just uh, cholesterol, but also tympanoplasty, particularly in the pediatric population, showing that endoscopic ear surgery seems to have a trend towards re reducing the residual rates in uh, children. And this sort of makes sense a little bit if you're thinking about it logically, because, because of course, even when we're doing canal wall up work with mastoidectomies in children for cholesterol, when we're doing the retrotympanic and the pro-tympanic dissection and the anterior epitympanic dissection, we're often doing that blindly with the microscope. So if we can put a 30 and 45 degree endoscope in there and get a similar or get a better view and remove that disease confidently, then logically we're likely to get better residual uh, rates. And the success rates of perforation closure are similar to microscopic ear surgery. So I think in the pediatric loop, we're now getting really robust data suggesting that this seems to be at least an equivalent rate, uh, equivalent um, method for disease closure, tympanic membrane closure rates up to three years and cholesterol are up to eight years. So it's really a, probably a preferred method because when we're avoiding incisions, at least in the pediatric population. And here, a very good friend of ours from University of Toronto, Adrian James, he's a very honest and deliberate uh, researcher, runs and puts his own data into his own database, comparing his pediatric uh, work for attic cholesterol, particularly showing that 65 cases of total endoscopic use surgery, this is over a 10 year period compared to 112 post auricularly, with his residual disease uh, rates being significantly lower in uh, endoscopic ear surgery, uh, reaching statistical significance. Um, one thing I have noticed recently with my own work, particularly in adult work, is why did I used to get this sort of situation endoscopically where we were getting recurrence like this in 2015, but in 2020, we're getting uh, better outcomes, at least with re-retraction. And some of this may be related to the use of the balloon, um, but also I think some of it is from this paper published by our friends from Modena and from Verona, Livia Prasutti and Daniele. And what they did here was they had a mean follow-up, uh, historical uh, controls, but mean follow-up of five years in two groups of 55 patients. One group had canal wall up and one, one group had endoscopic ear surgery. And they compared the recurrence rates. So not residual rates, but recurrence, re-retraction rates, and demonstrated that in endoscopic ear surgery, they had less recurrence in endoscopic ear surgery compared to canal wall up. And they, they postulated that it was to do with mucosal preservation and primarily performing uh, ascicular reconstruction and, and or leaving intact chain in place. And the concept here is that we're re-ventilating. So this is the concept of functional, potentially functional endoscopic ear surgery, where we're re-ventilating the middle ear by performing a primary ascicular reconstruction. And uh, the question is, is this uh, preservation of mucosa and performing the reconstruction and allowing the reventilation rate, allowing this reduced recurrence rate? And, and so I think uh, there are many reasons why we will get re recurrence in patients. And of course, nasal and eustachian tube dysfunction is a significant one. And the dis there's differences between sclerotic and aerated mastoids and mesotympanic and retrotympanic cholesterol. But if we're specifically looking at attic cholesterol, then these are the sort of uh, things that I think could make potentially a difference when we're doing uh, primary reconstruction. And that is that we try and minimize damage to the primary isthmus. So this is our own patient here. We were removing disease uh, and, and trying to reconstruct. And one of the points we do when we're reconstructing, if we can, is try and do a primary acicular reconstruction here, and then try and pay some attention to how we primarily reconstruct the attic with beveling and cuffing of the perichondrium. So you can see here, the, the medial aspect is uh, abutting the primary reconstruction and the lateral aspect is uh, creating a bevel to lock into the groove. So here I'm demonstrating how we created the bevel with our um, tragal reconstruction and placing this into the attic. And then we're doing a primary reconstruction to try and recreate ventilation pathways and then fashioning the cartilage cap to go on top of that. You can see here, we try and create a, a, a cartilage cap to sit on top of the primary reconstruction. And then we can see here after the, cart the cartilage cap on top of the acicular reconstruction and then the attic reconstruction is placed abutting medially onto the primary reconstruction and then locking into the uh, attic reconstruction. So we pay a bit more attention to this and this might reduce our recurrence rates. And similarly, when we're doing this with mesotympanic disease, 
you can see that we try and do this with one continuous cuff, with one for the mesotympanum and the other one for the attic to try and reduce recurrence in these patients. So reducing attic reconstruction and pneumatized mastoid, th there may be a, a role to be played with the endoscope here where we can preserve mucosa and do primary acicular reconstruction and pay more attention to our attic to try and reduce recurrences uh, for our patients in this sort of scenario. So where we are in 20... 20 now is that endoscopic ear surgery is really likely the prerogative of the middle ear and the mastoid is really the prerogative of microscopic ear surgery but of course they're complementary tools so we're not just endoscopic ear surgeons we're just modern day otologists so here we would say that there are still scenarios when we're using the endoscope where we switch back to the microscope and you can see in the previous uh, in the previous um, view that we have the microscope available all the time when we're doing endoscopic ear surgery. So I have difficult single-handed situations like you can see here when we've got granulation around the stapedius tendon in this right ear or in scenarios where we're trying to cut flaps where we need to switch back to the microscope to use the suction for counter-traction. And of course it makes no sense to harvest grafts and things like that when we can uh, with the endoscope where we can do that so confidently with two hands. So we interchange both instruments during the one operation quite routinely. And there are situations where we can extend the use of the uh, microscope by using the endoscope if we've got disease posterior to the lateral semicircular canal or retrofacial dissection, or we use when there's complications, for example, then we need to use the uh, microscope when we're using the endoscope. And we can extend the use of the microscope with the use of the endoscope when we are doing microscopic surgery through the ear canal. And this is work from Daniela where he's doing transotic approaches to now even up to two centimeter acoustic neuroma surgery, but there are not many units in the world that can possibly achieve this sort of work um, easily because they just have a sheer volume in, Vod in Verona where they can perform these operations and, and extend the boundaries of what's going on with the endoscope. But here's some uh, small work that we published just at the beginning of this year with a patient of ours who had an expanding intracochlear tumor with unilateral hearing loss and tinnitus. And we performed an endoscopic partial cochleotomy and simultaneous cochlear implantation. So a left ear here, you can see the incostopedial joint, the malleus has been removed. I used the piezo device to remove one third of the cochlea. And then we essentially sort of um, remove the cochlear tumor and then use the depth gauge inserter to sort of dental floss the remaining anterior aspect of the intracochlear tumor to remove all of the tumor. This is a, a technique from Stefan Plonke in, in Germany where he uh, demonstrated this and he's published a much larger series. And then we performed, we used a CI uh, perimodiola electrode and then reconstructed the whole area with uh, cartilage graft and demonstrated near normal hearing at six months following uh, the surgery. So really just an extension of the endoscope where we can do partial um, surgery to get a better view into the middle ear. Now, as we're getting a digitization of our endoscope image, we can extend and change the spectrum of what we can see, what the human eye can see. And so potentially we could stain cholesteatoma and view it beyond what we can normally see and, and deliberately remove cholesteatoma with stains. And, and this technique of digitizing the image has now moved into the microscope and we're getting now exoscopic digital 3D views of the microscope and allowing us to have heads up surgery where we can have more ergonomic surgery for us as, as surgeons. And so we can see how the digitization of the endoscope view and the digitization of the microscope view is coming together. And with the extension on improvements of steerable instruments, and with the digitization of the microscope and the endoscope and the introduction of robotics, well, really, we, we're seeing how now the endoscope is just part of a continuum of the otologic history and spectrum. So, of course, the endoscope is not really the be-all and end-all. It's really just a part of otologic history. We get um, similar outcomes to the microscopic approaches, but we can avoid incisions in a lot of our patients, particularly in our pediatric patients. So with modern otology, endoscopic ear surgery is really not the be-all and end-all, but it's a complementary tool to the microscope. So I'd like to thank you all for your uh, attention. And just to remind you that we've moved the fourth World Congress of Endoscopic Ear Surgery in Kyoto now from April 2021 to April 2022. And uh, we hope to see you all there now in Kyoto once again in 2022. Thank you once again to the organizing committee and to uh, David for the very kind opportunity to speak to you today.